Without further ado, I will introduce both the moderator and speaker. Dr. Chris Paulson received her PhD from the Department of Rhetoric at the University of California at Berkeley. Dr. Paulson is a specialist in contemporary art with a focus on time-based and computational media. Her first book, Here, There, Telepresence, Touch, and Art at the Interface received the 2018 Anne Friedberg Award for Innovative Scholarship from the Society for Cinema and Media Studies. Her work traces the intersections of art and engineering with a particular emphasis on telepresence, virtuality, and artificial intelligence. In her work, she examines the rise of AI, the automation of labor, per pervasive surveillance, and our virtual and embodied lives, and the increasingly inhabitable Earth. James Bridle is a writer, artist, and technologist who holds a master's degree in computer science and cognitive science from the University College in London, where their research focused on creative applications of artificial intelligence. Their artworks have been commissioned by galleries and, and institutions and exhibited worldwide and on the internet. The writing has appeared in magazines and newspapers, including Wired, The Atlantic, um, The New Statesman, The Guardian, and The Financial Times. Bridal published New Dark Age, a book about technology, politics, and society in 2018, which has been translated into over a dozen languages. In 2019, they wrote and presented New Ways of Seeing, a four-part series on art and technology for BBC Radio 4. And their second book, Ways of Being, is about technology, ecology, and more than human intelligence, which was published in 2022. Um, before I pass the mic over, a few housekeeping things. There will be about 10 minutes for Q&A towards the end of the panel. And we ask that if you have questions, you put those into the, the chat section um, where we will compile, compile them for the speakers. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here today. Um, I'm really excited to have this conversation, uh, mostly focused around James's new book, uh, Ways of Being. Um, and which I think actually is the most hopeful and inspiring book about AI I've read in a long time, and I've read a lot of them. Um, it, it actually moved me quite a bit. And I want to have a chance today to talk about all of the beautiful things that are in this book and that it opens onto, such as solidarity and social justice, multi-species thriving. And as I've already warned James, um, our shared interest in cephalopods, like I'm gonna wanna talk about octopuses today. Um, but before we get there, I wanted to start out, James, by asking you uh, kind of two stage setting questions, especially for people who might not be familiar with, with your work or kind of new to this topic. Um, this new book, um, Ways of Being, follows on, as Taryn mentioned, New Dark Age. And I I also really enjoyed this book, but it had a really different affect. <laughs> I feel like, you know, um, uh, it's about a lot of things, but, you know, one of the major threads we could say is about the datification of our lives and our world, so much of it generated by pervasive forms of surveillance and data scraping and processing, as well as algorithmic uh, nudging and prediction. And as you, I think, really clearly point out in this book, all of this information, all of the data that we're, we're kind of uh, producing and inundated with hasn't led to like a clear view of our world or our culture uh, or a coherent model of what we should do and how we should be. But instead, it's this inscrutable opacity and overwhelming incomprehensibility that comes out of a lot of this. So since it has this kind of different affect, and, and I do find your work all to be very hopeful um, in the end and, you know, open up in these ways, I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about how you got from the new dark age into ways of being, like to open up kind of that part of your thinking and, and process. Um, <clears throat> thanks very much. Uh, pleasure to be here. And thanks for, um, yeah, thanks for letting me have this chat. Um, so like I, my career, my background is, um, I don't really have a fixed, um, pathway. I'm not an academic. I'm not, um, uh, uh, I'm not, I was not settled in the visual arts world for a long time. I didn't go to art school, but I do a lot of work in the visual arts. I don't have a background or trained as a journalist, but I do things that sort of look like journalism to some people. Um, uh, so I kind of move across fields in the, in these various ways. Um, uh, tend to be sort of just poking at things that I find to be to be interesting, uh, and for a long time the the main focus of that work was technology, um, was um, particularly network technologies and the internet. Um, sorry, one second. Mm -hmm. 
let's hope that's better. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of my visual art was focused on that and a lot of my sort of critical writing. And, you know, for a long time, I, I really wanted to write a book about the internet. And I thought that that book would be a book about how great the internet is, because I've been on the internet since I was, uh, you know, almost, you know, certainly a very young teenager. Uh, for for the entire of my sort of critical thinking life, uh, the internet has been a huge part of it, um, and um, it's shaped my life and uh, all of our lives. But you know, it's a very personal thing as well for me, um, it, you know, in such powerful ways. And so I, you know, I, I always thought. It would I'd write this brilliant book. I even thought it would look like that, like the cover you've got that's all kind of rainbow colored and brilliant, having all those kind of, you know, um kind of RGB digital bright hues as part of it. Uh and you know, but I sat down to start writing that book between Brexit and the Trump election. Um a, a really particular moment when, you know, building on top of a lot of, of, of work I'd been making for some time about the problems I saw with the digital world we were building, like in that particular moment. It was kind of impossible to imagine writing a book about how great the internet was because it was so clearly whether it was failing us or whether our ideas of what it might do for us were failing or however you want to put that there was something clearly amiss that this was not um the magic wonderful technology that so many of us including absolutely myself had, had believed it might be for so long that would lead us into this kind of you know beautiful uh shiny happy future filled with where everyone will be full of knowledge and, and equal and, and beyond the nation state and all of these grand promises that were made for cyberspace. Um, and so I, I wrote New Dark Age and uh, it's it's a really depressing book. Let's be honest. I, I like I hope it's interesting. I'm really glad it's 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 uh, resonated with with readers, people who read it. Um, you know, I'm proud of the things that it says, but it's not it's not a cheerful book, really, <laughs> uh, though, though it contains seeds of hope because I'm just like that um um but you know it, it also i mean very directly and very personally again it, you know it put me into quite a dark place um uh in general just looking at you know the thing that i'd given so much thought and attention to in terms of the internet for such a large part of my life not just my professional work but also my personal feelings my kind of belief about how the world should be how it might change how it might progress into the future and also really specifically, uh, one of the aspects of the book that's not, there's only really kind of one chapter of New Dark Age, but that's really seemed to resonate with readers is the chapter on the climate and the relationship between technology, climatic change, climatic breakdown. Uh, that resonated very strongly with me. It was the first time I'd really spent um, a lot of time looking quite seriously at what was happening rather than just getting the kind of wash that we all get kind of ambiently these days. Um, and that definitely put me into a pretty, pretty bad place, to be honest, uh, as well, quite specifically in that thing. And so, you know, I, I basically I made the like decision to shift my practice, like as well as my, you know, I was already interested in going over there, but I was like, well, what would what would it look like to focus my work, all of my attention onto the onto an area of ecology? Um, and what would I do? You know, I mean, I could just go and sit in the road and and stop traffic, and I really applaud the people who are doing that in the present moment in various ways. Um, uh, but I wanted to see what I could take from what I already knew and bring it to bear on this area. Like, what could I possibly have to say about uh, the state of the living planet as someone who just you know spent you know twenty years just poking around on the internet? Um, but in that time, I'd, I'd also spent a lot of time thinking about AI, and I'm sure we'll discuss that a little bit more. Um, Though this is also a book about me wanting to get the hell away from AI <laughs> in many ways. Um, but I started thinking about these questions of intelligence that I had thought quite a lot about. And 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 there seemed to be this, I realized there was this extraordinary moment, or it seemed to me an extraordinary moment, when everyone was so, everyone, by everyone, I mean, you know, uh, a, a Northern European, North American, we, um, but, but culture that many of us live in very broadly, obsessed with artificial intelligence in this kind of incredibly weird way. We're completely obsessed with this idea that's having all kinds of strange effects to our culture. Why? Like this seemed to be an interesting question. Just at the moment as well, that there was a growing, again, cultural, though I think it's still lower than the general AI screamathon, um, that 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 we've kind of missed something about the intelligence of the broader world. Um, that kind of scientific research, but also non-Western, non-scientific knowledges that have known this all along are starting to be heard a little bit more in very interesting ways and at such a critical moment for 
you know our civilization our species uh that those two things were happening in parallel seems to me okay there's something here and there's something i can i can perhaps speak to because i've thought a lot about one form of intelligence that maybe i can kind of open something up and, and take it through into talking about some other ones that's fantastic because you know i think uh not only is kind of our algorithmic culture and prediction and the climate you know crisis all really depressing topics but ai is is a pretty depressing topic and the way it's talked about a lot um in pop culture um is you know one that has a lot of scaremongering and fearfulness in it and even a kind of hand waving that like we've started these processes and they're just you know uh, out of control and and we'll just see we'll ride it and see where it goes or something like that and and i think there's bits in new dark age i'm thinking particularly about like the youtube recommendation engines <laughs> chapter and things like that which um you know it is uh an automated suggestion process but you know we have this idea that ai is everywhere that everything is ai and it's all kind of creating this world which um is a threat to us and inescapable and i think that's one of the things that i liked so much about ways um ways of being is that it it takes a real kind of turn from that and you know so thinking about not this doomsdaying full paperclip mode we are you know <laughs> set off on a bunch of processes we can't stop but but thinking about the ways in which ai and the crises uh whether those are existential or or you know kind of more material crises that are happening today give us a moment to think about what we were, want the world to be and reconsider uh how we cosmologically kind of shape the world and imagine our values in relationship to it so i think there's so much productive in there and uh, but i want to get a little bit to this the scary ai stuff um because it's so much of what we hear and in part around a a moment in the book that made me laugh out loud because it's just so um on point and and so great which is um i'm going to paraphrase you here a bit but something along the lines of you know why are we so afraid of immortal conglomerate non-human entities with the rights of legal persons that have goals that are misaligned with human thriving um that's it's scary that's scary but it's already here it's called a corporation and we're really comfortable with with this and in fact we tend to imagine all of our ai both in our um kind of literature and movies and other forms of popular culture and even in the ways in the products that we roll out under this mode of corporate kind of ai and um and you say great things you know like we have if we're worried about you know um intelligence is equal to human to to the point that they supplant us um we've are, and get rights and and marginalize us you know this is something that's already happened right corporate speech is protected corporate personhood is recognized and these super beings lack empathy and they're hard to kill <laughs> you say like you know this is we're here already we're in the terminator skynet nightmare they're just corporations um and so what i found so profound and helpful about the book is to say like okay well this fear this thing that we are, you know, um, you know, wringing our hands over is, is has already happened. So, what do we think about? Uh, how can we readjust and reimagine uh, how things could be otherwise? And so, this was, I think, just like such a helpful kind of pause on so much of the rhetoric um, that circulates today. And so, maybe I can ask you to speak a bit about um, how how this emerges in ways of being. You know, if we are used to imagining these what now seem like corporate kinds of intelligences um how like what else, what other kinds of intelligence are there out there or how can we um imagine these things you know you're interested in non-human intelligence but how how do we begin to dream a world and a technology that isn't revolved around kind of maximizing process uh profits uh extractive uh destructive and unequal processes like what are the potential modes that you found that are really meaningful to you or that you want us to open up either in the book or or, or since you know um since talking about it and and um you know thinking about it more yeah no I mean it's 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 really crazy because it's accelerated a lot even in the very brief time since the book was published I think I mean you know, when I was writing the book I didn't feel like a lot of people had heard that rhetoric uh I'd heard it because I follow certain tech news or I'm aware of some of the discourse around AI you know 
as recently as three, four years ago, perhaps, when, you know, there were these kind of quite weird statements being made by people like Elon Musk, people like Bill Gates, um, people at Google and DeepMind and so on and so forth, were making these kind of bizarrely apocalyptic statements, but they were mostly making it within the community. Those guys are having meetings with like world leaders now uh, in a really completely bonkers way. That is, you know, largely kind of misdirection and there's something very strange going on there um with let's loop back to that but just to say um also i think it's also important to state that um you know for those who are unclear in the audience when people talk about ai they're just talking about really big and fast computers um there is the idea of something which is very interesting which is what we might call genuine not general but genuine artificial intelligence Sorry. um and i think it might ex exist potentially like i have no there's no there's no part of me that thinks that can't exist uh but i'm fairly sure we haven't got there yet um what we have at the moment are very powerful very fast computers um which are pretty cool and they could do all this amazing stuff but that's what they are and it's also critical to underline like how they came about how we got to this current point in ai which underlies this point of corporate ai and that's the fact is that though i get yelled at by by people who are you know, saying this, there's been no major conceptual breakthroughs in the field for decades. There have been some really impressive new types of maths you can do uh, and some incredibly brilliant new chip designs and a whole bunch of other stuff. But we're talking about an idea of what makes computational intelligence that is decades old at this point. And what has made the current wave of AI possible is not any kind of brilliant idea about what intelligence is or what it might be or how it might act, but the corporate dominance of a few massive companies that have used serving ads to generate vast amounts of revenue that they have then spent on very, very powerful, fast computers, uh, which are filled with all the data they've harvested through those ads and by other methods. Um, this is the direct result of a technological business model that's been in operation for, what, 15 or so years now, Google, Facebook. The reason social media giants, other people running AI, is because they're the ones with all the money and all the data. And so you're getting their idea of what intelligence is, um, but also the, the intelligence they know how to build, um, which as I say is not a particularly new idea, though it is fascinating in all these kinds of ways but it's basically just really fast computers filled with all the data that they've stolen from us. So that's one thing. Um, and then there's the there's this there's the kind of broader thing, realization that leads to that you've, you've articulated already, which is this idea of kind of corporate AI, of, of what does intelligence look like when it's only imagined in corporate boardrooms, which is just not the kind of intelligence most of us, I hope, or I want to believe, think of as intelligence, uh, which is something far more interesting, complex and embodied. But if you see the kind of AI that they get excited about, you know, which is like the AI that beats people at games or the AI that makes cars better, um, like those, are just, it's not very interesting, <laughs> um, at like a species level, um, by which I mean, like the ability to win is not the most interesting thing and it's not necessarily a sign of intelligence being better at a game than someone or being better at driving or being able to do a bunch of these tasks they're useful and good but they're, they're to think that they are the pinnacle of what is possible for any being to achieve is incredibly narrow so they have this kind of incredibly yeah narrow version of intelligence that's 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 formed around profit making that comes out of the same capitalist undertaking that has powered this kind of AI revolution. And when you start to notice that, or at least I feel this way, you start to notice that, you start to notice it in only everything. Um, you start to say, well, if you know, what what is what is this AI going to do? The one that the the that they're all worried about, one that's the, this crazy media storm at the moment about is the dangers of AI, that AI will end us as a species. You, you ask like, how? Like, what, what, how does that how does that cataclysm actually come about? And the, you know, the, the what I say in the book is, it it feels like it's it's an existential threat 
to people who've had no other real existential threats before because they're incredibly rich uh, and they're essentially worried and that AI will do to them what they've been doing to everybody else all along. So is that that is that what you want to circle back to, like why Elon Musk and people like that? Yeah, are... that's why they're that's why they're afraid of it. Um, <laughs> it's, because it's essentially, that, yeah, they, 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 they have, it's a threat to their their business, but the rest of us have been threatened by their businesses for mm -hmm. forever. Um, for most of us, the vast vast ninety nine point nine 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 percent of us are not at threat from this kind of runaway AI. And so, but then having thought a little, you know, if, if we can think of, okay, so currently existing ideas of AI, even if it's just very fast computers, um, like if they are just this narrow corporate vision, then at least we have a, a kind of set of things that we can start to look outside and say, well, if it wasn't like that, if it was, if it was something else, if it wasn't competitive, if it wasn't winner takes all, if it wasn't focused on outmatching like humans <laughs> or everybody else, like what could it start to look like? What different relationships might we have towards it? Um, how differently might it be constituted if it was not based on a very narrow human contemporary modernist capitalist perspective? And, and therefore it becomes a starting point for thinking quite radically differently about it. Yeah, well, it seems like part of the problem there is that we're always looking for ourselves. We want intelligences that are in some ways mirrors, um, maybe a better mirror or until to a certain degree, but we can only, there's, there's this limitation to our own intelligence that we can only seem to seek it out in models that, that are mirrors. And I think that's one of the things that is so interesting about some of the other, um, models that you offer uh, in in the book, and I, and I do want to talk about octopuses, or just this idea that you bring out throughout that um, there are, you know, the, the, what, you, what you term or use the term umwelt uh, to kind of get into, that, that there's other kinds of worlds that surround um, different kinds of beings, and, and we don't see a mirror in them, but yet they have intelligences that are maybe more helpful for us at this moment, especially when we are thinking outside of corporate um, logics. And so I wanted maybe you to talk about some of these other kinds of things that come up, whether it's about trees or octopuses or fungi, like these, these other kinds of worlds that might start opening to us and worlds of intelligence. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, first is mentioned starting with the, what was the first thing you said there which is this this need for us to kind of see ourselves in the mirror is one of the kind of most characteristic factors of our thinking about intelligence in general um because obviously it's not just the big evil capitalists who are kind of rubbish at doing this we, we're all pretty rubbish about doing this um uh, and that's as you say because we we tend to imagine it on a human model um like the the history of intelligence as in the history of human thinking about what intelligence is, is largely a, a you know a, a history of asking like what it is that humans do and how does that make us so special? Um, so we kind of canonize the things that we do well uh, and try to um, look for them in other species. And then if other species you know demonstrate those particular qualities, like we'll kind of grudgingly admit that they're not bad at being intelligent. They're not like us, obviously, but um you know we'll sort of we'll give them a little bit of kudos for being smart but only in the ways that we recognize as being smart um uh you know the, and, the, and those are the kind of then the the ideas of intelligence that we that we promulgate um the you know most of the kind of big classic experiments from and intelligence research even in, including in non-humans from, from history is, is is kind of littered with examples of this um one of the most um and all of these are contested, by the way, by, by psychologists and docs in various forms, because the history of intelligence is really fraught and no one agrees on a definition and no one kind of has a, a set thing on this. But one of the very famous ones is a thing that's been going on for decades called the mirror test, um, which is this this thing where it became this idea, starts with a guy called Gordon Gallup, that there'd be some, there's something powerful to a creature recognizing itself in a mirror. Why, why is that interesting? Well, because it implies that that creature recognizes that is some kind of individual that is is a it's it's its own agent. Um that is not just a, a machine that acts, which historically is how humans in the West 
and under the dominant scientific kind of paradigm have considered all non-humans to be essentially like machines that act in these various ways but have no feelings or cognizance or recognition of themselves um so if we could say that they had recognition of themselves oh that would shift uh, this idea of intelligence in various interesting ways and so we spent decades of various putting various animals in front of mirrors to see what they do um and it, it you know it immediately gets like incredibly interesting um uh because you um uh you start to see like different species react in quite different ways and and you start to see the extent to which we can recognize that um you have uh, you know if you do it with primates um so the the larger primates the ones that are closely related to us like gorillas and chimpanzees and stuff you can kind of see their reactions in fact they get very complex gorillas show a kind of shyness in front of the mirror it seems um they like they, they quite they don't like being observed uh, they're quite private uh, at least the ones that have been raised in these kind of weird forms of activity because all of this happens within these completely artificial yeah. environments as well or most of it um you get things like the fact that elephants uh that the indian elephants have been judged to be intelligent um or because at least one of them that was kept in a horrible enclosure for years kind of performed this experiment in the way, but African elephants haven't uh, because they keep smashing the mirrors because uh, they're just too big to do this experiment on. And so we run up into, into all these kind of kind of crazy limitations. Um, when they showed them to dolphins, um, the dolphins uh, just started having sex in front of the mirrors all the time. That was their so main dolphin. reaction. Uh, and uh yeah and so you 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 realize almost immediately that that the the ways that we think about intelligence what constitutes intelligence is radically different and you have to start thinking about why and then this gets this gets super interesting um because you know in other experiments when they got these kind of weird results it would take decades to figure out why something that we expected to see you know wouldn't work in the way that it did so my favorite example of which is is the gibbons who i write about in the book who um you know, for decades, refused to participate, basically, in a bunch of the experiments that were supposed to show how smart they were. And we sort of, they, they're clearly smart, they're doing all this kind of stuff, but they refused, there was this particular test that involved putting some food outside their enclosure and giving them a kind of stick to reach it with. And chimps and baboons and various others would, would happily do this. Um, and the, the gibbons wouldn't for decades. And so science had to be like, well, they're just clearly not smart. Um, until one day someone hung the the sticks from the top of their enclosure and then immediately the people grabbed the sticks and went sorry i said people but they are people but yeah. i'm talking about the Person, gibbons yeah. grab the sticks i like like this um and and the, and the and ate the treats and immediately became intelligent in this way and the reason one perhaps possibly the reason they did that is because gibbons are uh, arboreal they live most of their time in the trees swinging around and so their intelligence and their body pattern and their whole awareness is kind of oriented differently to humans do and so the only way to imagine the intelligence of another being to imagine it crucially is to is to imagine what it's like to be embodied to experience that the world in the way and immediately you start to see intelligence as being something that's not just about what goes inside the head right it's not just a brain in a jar it's the way in which you relate to the world in all these kind of ways and i made that distinction about how you can imagine intelligence because obviously there's huge amounts most of the creatures in the world the vast majority i say we can't imagine like we're never going to imagine what their intelligence is and i find that fascinating as well because because their experience of the world must be so radically different to ours um but it doesn't mean we can't recognize it it doesn't mean we can't acknowledge it it doesn't mean we can't you know um I, I treat them in particular as 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 acknowledging that they have these um even if even if it's um not possible for us to imagine it in quite the same way and that has all kinds of ramifications yeah you know having read your book it um it it piqued my octopus interest again and i i picked up a novel by ray naylor that had just come out kind of around the same time i don't know if you've read mountain i have sea. i know the one you're referring to yeah yeah and and it really there are such strong connections between the ideas that you are just articulating here and now and in your book about kind of imagining oneself into the body and you know the senses and the arrangement of another creature to imagine what intelligence might be and it's this fascinating uh book for those who haven't read it i really recommend it and i won't um try not to spoil things too much but it's set at a moment in the near future where we have the kind of humanoid 
intelligence that rivals our own that's embodied as a robot it creates or an android creates big existential crises for uh humanity they try to you know kind of contain it and shut it down but at the same moment uh biologists realize that there are octopus cultures that have evolved for you know thousands of years in ways that are actually quite parallel to our own with symbolic language and kind of uh communicating across generations. Um, and it becomes a kind of alien first contact story um, once once the scientists can kind of imagine themselves into the bodies to understand how um, their intelligence operates and how we can accommodate ourselves to understanding them. But the first, it's not really a first contact story because the octopus has known us for a long time and they've realized we are intelligent and they do not like us very much at all. And so there's this, um, I mean, it's this really kind of amazing, uh, you know, philosophical uh, problem or way to think through things. And it, but it got me thinking about the way that uh, science fiction uh, features in in some of your work and how um, right ways of being has. You mentioned novelists kind of throughout it as um, as touchstones for helping you think. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how. Do uh, does science fiction or speculative forms of literature? How do novelists kind of play out in your thinking and you know your process of um, understanding the world as it's given and the way that it can be? Yeah, um, that's a lovely question um, because like other writing is hugely important to my work in various ways, and I guess I'd like, I'd like to bring a couple of things to that. Uh, the first is that science fiction and and speculative fictions in general are play play a huge role. I'm, like a fan and I'm super interested. This this last book, Ways of Being, owes, owes a huge amount to to various people. Um uh you know, actually the octopus science fiction, I have a different octopus science fiction in the book, which yeah, is I know. Tchaikovsky's work. Um, but I also really liked um uh, The Mountain Under the Sea as well when I read that after. Um uh but um Ursula Le Guin is a constant touchstone. Yeah. He imagined kind of so many of these worlds. Um uh and Kim Stanley Robinson in particular, who's um uh, the Ministry of the Future, I think, is a really, I think, I, and it's always been a part of my work. I mean, um, William Gibson's work was a um, a huge um, influence on me, you know. But also, I think this is probably true of these kind of more. I think maybe particularly someone like Kim Stanley Robinson and others. In in that, what I feel very lucky is I've I've been reading their work for long enough now that I've seen a trajectory in their work that interests me profoundly. Um, you know, there's, you know, many people might be familiar with, you know, William Gibson from the early kind of cyberpunk works, Neomancer and others that really imagined a vision of the future that kind of came to pass in many ways. Uh, everyone still thinks it's cool, even though it turns out to be horrible. Um, and it's very corporate. I mean, it's one of those and it's, it's incredibly imagine. corporate. It's incredibly corporate. He, he really did foresee that. Uh, yeah. And like many cyberpunk authors, it was a warning, not a script. Um, uh, you know, but then over the years, watched a lot of people now might know him from the more recent TV series, The Peripheral, um, that's based on his more recent work. And it's really fascinating to see how his work does a few things, one of which was to um, come closer and closer to the present. The more recent yeah. work has kind of disappeared off into the future again, but with this weird time wormhole stuff going on. But like there's a lot of books in the middle that moved closer and closer to the present. And yeah, very much like about the real... present and our technologies as they existed, yeah. Yeah, he was really kind of reporting almost live on new things that were turning up. Like yeah, the early 2000 yes, and VR pattern recognition and things like that, yeah. Yeah, and so that was hugely influential to say, like, you can, you, can, you can write about this stuff and you can think about this stuff and you can kind of invent ways of talking about it as it happens. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, that, you know, one way that's been hugely influential on my work in, in the in ways of being, I write quite a lot about... Um, a little bit about this attempt to build a self-driving car um uh you know and the the, the self-driving car was an attempt to see what it was like to, to to work directly personally with a very simple form of ai but also to treat it as a colleague or as a collaborator rather than as an antagonist what was it like to kind of sit next to it and do more interesting things than i thought were being done with kind of corporate mm -hmm. ai um but it was also like you know part of a lot of work I've done where I've, I've looked as closely as I can as a kind of outside amateur at technologies that are just in that moment of going from uh, science fiction to kind of 
banal every day, right? Which was self-driving cars are such a good example of because for, for decades they were, you know, their science fiction is total recall or, you know, whatever you want to pick from the movies of, of, of that. And then suddenly like you can just buy them in the dealership and they're a bit crap, but they work uh, probably better than humans eventually, even though they'll probably kill some humans like humans. Like, and it's just like they're just every day. And in that and that moment seems to happen so fast. Of course, it's stacked upon decades of all kinds of research, but, but most of us are not involved in or party to. And so it feels often to us that these things are just kind of meteorites, boom, boom, like just lumps of the future kind of crashing to earth around us, disrupting like a lot of what we know. And And, you know, when is the moment when we, again, I use this term we very loosely, but I use it largely for a kind of agential public, uh, non-specialists, um, uh, non-elites uh, of various kinds. Again, I should be careful how I phrase that. Um, do, what, what, what can we say about this? How can we shape it? How can we speak about it? And I think, you know, Gibson was a, a good example of that for me. And I see that happening in, in the work of Kim Stanley Robinson at the moment, you know, who wrote a lot of big arcing future stuff. And now um, you know, with Missy Future, I think it's much more about, like, so really writing much more in the present. Like what do we do right now in an emergency? Of course, some of the Ursula Le Guin has been, uh, you know, has been doing that um, uh, for, for a very long time. And, um, uh, and some other writers I want to name and can't. Um, uh, but the other person I would also bring up who's been very important to that is Amitav Ghosh, um, who uh, I've written about a little bit, you know, who's a, a writer of both fiction and nonfiction, who is capable of, um, who, who writes really inc incredible stuff in, in both in both formats. In particular, you know, uh, this, his recent book, The Nug Makes Curse, is a really extraordinary description of the relationship between colonialism and capitalism but there's also a previous book called um uh the great derangement which is about various things but one of the things it's about is about how you write about climate change um as a novelist really and also as a novelist in like the western bourgeois tradition even though he comes from a slightly different place as, as an indian writer but again indian writer with, within quite a english language tradition um who's really struggling and thinking very carefully about how do we as artists, as you know, writers, as whatever we are, like respond to these moments of incredible complexity, of of stories that seem to be at scales much larger than us. You know, you could substitute climate change for capitalism, for um, uh, technology, for the internet in these various ways. Like, how do how do you write about systems at these kind of vast scales that we all are aware that we live within, but really struggle to conceptualize? And we can take a lot from fiction um and just various modes of writing and telling these stories as, as you know that could be very very useful to help us to help us think about them um if we if we if we want to do that yeah i'm a, I'm a huge kim stanley robinson fan too i something i talk about too much in my life here and i i do think some of um it, it's fascinating hey gibson but a lot of others that we think about writing about the future are writing about our present or kind of just a moment Always. a few yeah. a few steps out it's it's a kind of fascinating um uh, realignment of some of these projects that what we need to write about is actually now, um, or the, which I think is great. But I also think Robinson is someone who, at least for me, has um, offered some of the the positive models of AI or, or ones that aren't kind of corporate and totally destructive, like uh, through a lot of his books, there's a character or, or a entity called Pauline, which is like a collect a repository or memory or kind of that functions more as like an ancestral kind of connection to to history that that it's interesting that different in those there are some um, models I think that can be brought out that are different than the ones we have and I I wanted to get to you know so many things from your book that I realized we won't have time to get to but um something that has struck me you know or or that when I talk to people about this book, uh, you know, people are always like, oh, the solidarity chapter, like you're know, talking about how solidarity as as a theme that emerges in a book about AI is a really, you know, necessary um, thing. And um, I just wanted to think about how how we grow solidarity. And, and I think you've already talked a little bit about how we might reach out to non-human uh, forms of intelligence as whether they're animals or plants. Maybe we can get a little more into those things. But but something that really struck me is that um, so much of the way that you figure kind of this broad solidarity that's functioning in 
the book has to do with um, a dissolution of the binaries that, you know, in Western culture, um, in particular in Western uh, post-Enlightenment and on, but the cosmologies that come out of that and of science, um, so many of them are um, kind of what needs to go in, in this book, whether that is that boundary line between um, the, uh, an intelligent thing and one that isn't, you know, by our standards deemed to be intelligent, but even, and there's something I've been thinking about a lot recently is um, that borderline between something that is living and and non-living. And, you know, we think about what's happening on Mars today, not just what Elon Musk wants to happen on Mars, but like the astrobiological missions that are going on through NASA. It's to figure out a moment where like what we consider resources and we, you know, what, what, what kind of like the corporate world considers resources of minerals, of rocks, of the power generated by, um, by non-living things that at some moment in time, like that flipped over in, into life through this kind of magic of, of chemistry. Um, and so I want maybe you to talk about how it is that we not just grow solidarity, but how the, like the logic of binaries um, is, you know, part of what's, keeping us from having these um these relationships to the the non-human world the more than human world but also like this this non-living world that we've we've kind of taken uh in many ways for ourselves rather than letting it kind of have its own personhood or agency and some of that's you know legally changing but it's i thought that was one of the most profound um kind of provocations in the book uh that's a lot but I'll, I'll, I'll try this. No, no, it's all good. Uh, and the, I'll try and say a couple of things towards it. I mean, the first of which is that, uh, you know, there's always a politics to this. And I, I think that's just worth laying straight up. Um, and what I mean by that in the context of this book, that, you know, I was never interested in, I would never be interested in just writing a book about like loads of cool animal stories as cool as the animal stories are and how fascinating they are and the way in which they like hopefully they certainly thinking about it these kind of stories shifts my relationship to the world in in totally real meaningful ways that maybe don't even require any further political um politics beyond that um except they kind of do uh, because for me it then becomes impossible to to think that one could go on living in the same way and in the same political relationships as we do at present having thought these thoughts having made having had these realizations that um something has to radically shift in our relationships um uh when we can no longer pretend we don't know what we know um because there's so many layers of knowing so it's, it's worth pointing that as well like you know the the there's so many points in writing this book when I just had to go, isn't this, isn't this just really obvious? I mean, it's certainly obvious to, to people from outside the sort of Christian Western enlightenment tradition, uh, in so many ways, um, uh, you know, or at least monotheistic perhaps, but anyway, you know, um, it's also, uh, so, obvious to anyone who's like spent time with non-humans in any meaningful way which is frankly all of us we just tend to compartmentalize it and maybe that compartmentalization speaks to this kind of binary but anyone who has had a meaningful relationship with a non-human has no doubts about the awareness personhood and agency of non-humans but we somehow still manage to put it into these weird little boxes that stop us putting that all together um you know, and I, I'm absolutely 100% guilty of this to anyone else. You know, in the book, I wrote a lot about Monica Galliano, a scientist who's, who did this amazing research into uh, various forms of intelligence in, in plants, in plant species, um, in which she showed, you know, and I won't go into the whole experiment because we don't have a lot of time, but they're all in the book and in her own writing, which is amazing, um, uh, showing that plants remember, showing that they experience certain things and that um uh they they hold on to that experience they behave differently um uh in the future uh a bunch of other different extraordinary things that when animals do we call intelligence um uh there's no real question about that and she constructed these these uh, you know really clever experiments to show this uh but she also really annoys a lot of people uh because she talks quite openly about having a shamanic practice uh where she also alongside her scientific work 
goes off to South America and other places, does dieta with shaman, uh, walks a spiritual path um, and has communicated directly with plant spirits who in some cases have told her how to design the experiments. Uh, she also writes beautifully as a scientist, as someone who is willing to share, like to acknowledge how she's come by that knowledge. She talks about the plants as collaborators and so on and so forth. And, you know, it's really interesting the way that's affected her work and the reception of it in the sense that, you know, it took her quite a long time to find ways of publishing this because there was some resistance to the way she frames her work, even though it's framed scientifically. Um, it also reveals something about the fact that when you reveal these kind of knowledges, we don't know where to put them. Uh, you know, is this is this biology? Is this neuroscience? There's no such thing as plant neuroscience because no one believed plants could be intelligent. So there's a kind of missing journal there. So like it breaks the sort of scientific categorizations, these kind of new knowledges. But also it just like fundamentally bothers people because you're talking about two radically different ways of understanding and thinking the world. Um, and ultimately the scientific method of knowing and the shamanic way of knowing are different. Um, they're, they're, they're approaches to the same world, the same universe along very, very different paths. And it's very difficult to hold them together. Galliano does this and she does it so brilliantly because like even the people who are hardcore science, 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 that's all woo woo nonsense. Like the experiments still work. They're still reproducible. They're still peer reviewed. So if you only believe in the science, you can still take the knowledge of these experiments and just ignore all that other stuff. If you try to do differently, even with the best of intentions, it's still really hard. I find it hard. I am acculturated deeply enough into very deeply into kind of Western dominant scientific ways of knowing the world that even I struggle to be like, I don't, something bothers me about, about giving these things equal weight, equal credibility, or at least it used to, I think I'm probably getting better at it, but it takes work. It takes work to work your way out from, um, from that kind of singular binary viewpoint of seeing these things as being opposites. Um, uh, and and totally incommensurate, rather than lenses that we can choose to pick up and put down and even cross in order to see the world in kind of radically different ways. And it's those, you know, different ways of knowing that are revealed by these quite different ways of, um, yeah, of approaching the world on on these different terms. Um, and the the final point to that is, you know, once if you it, you you to your point of this living and non-living which is which is super interesting um uh i i like to bring the non-living into it's present in in the, in the ways of being in various ways well first of all obviously well no not first of all i bring the non-living in various ways um the the technology that we are talking through right now is made up um in various ways from the bodies of creatures who died billions of years ago who have been compacted onto the back into the earth and we have reformatted burned melted uh, their bodies in various ways in order to produce the plastics oils and various things that are allowing us to communicate in that moment and and they are their life produced this living moment even if we currently consider them to be non-living and so they just even thinking about things in a that incredibly like scientific way even though i'm using slightly silly ways of words of describing it is a kind of animating force for me um though of course if you if you walk the other path if you walk down the shamanic path um then there's there's no separation between the living and the non-living everything is just everything is one solid living field of energy and most non dominant science modes of knowing the world recognize that in in all kinds of ways there's simply no meaningful distinction there and you know to go full circle on that i think that that comes that's going to bring us back to a very interesting question if we start talking about what actual ai is that emerges from non-living machines i again really struggle with this idea because even though i can sort of imagine an intelligence in a mountain like I've met, I've met the God of the mountain. Like I understand like a divinity and a landscape and a meaningful beinghood and agency within landscapes in that way. I still struggle to see it in computers because they're just lumps of plastic, right? Like the, like where does it, how does it descend into them? Like if, if it is something animate in some way, then where does it come from? These are, these are really fascinating questions that, well, basically shouldn't be left to, to rich billionaires running social media companies. Um, they have real, like philosophical, political, social, living consequences for all of us, and immediate ones, of course, um, because like we're we're destroying the world around us at a rapid rate, 
and and changing our relationship with it is is currently like an is a is the real existential threat, right? Um, nothing to do with AI coming to destroy us. We have a very real existential threat on our doorstep, existential to us as a species at least, which is kind of a big deal. Um, and the the personally, I think is, you know, the will only be addressed through what amounts to a shift in consciousness, which is a change in our relationship with, with non-humans in all kinds of ways is an absolute prerequisite for any kind of survival as a species. Yeah, there's a few things that I, I find really fascinating there, both that, you know, that even though we're framing um, some of these an more animistic kinds of ideas as against Western science, still when, um, when scientists look closely enough, those those boundary lines disappear, which is what's kind of I think so fascinating about astrobiology. It's like we can we can hold up these divisions, but actually the more and more you zoom in, you know, those those boundary lines get harder to find. And then the other thing that I just wanted to point out, and again, maybe I'm thinking about this on you know election day here, um, in relationship to you know what you're saying and, and solidarity is that you have this really uh, wonderful um, moment in the book, and I forgive me for kind of quoting you directly, um, but you write political progress is not a zero sum game throughout the history of human society. The improvements in our collective lives have been driven by an increase in the set of people we see as fully human whose problems we consider real. And I think, you know, obviously, you know, most <laughs> most stories about AI, you know, from science fiction are colonial metaphors and and kind of investigate our, um, you know, kind of histories of racialized capitalism and, and things like that. But 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 you're expanding this, I think, even more into these areas of um you know, not just AI, but into the world around us that we we have to be with and that we must be with and that must thrive for in order for us to thrive. And so I I really just love that that sentiment that, you know, we need to expand kind of personhood in in all sorts of ways. And we have never lost anything by this, that it's all gains. And so um, these other ways of thinking and other ways of being, you know, uh, open ups up to a, a you know, a, a potentially new great world. And it's, it's AI and some of these crises, existential crises that people are fantasizing that almost open up the opportunity to think more broadly in these ways. Um, yeah, one hundred percent. I don't. I don't think I can. I think I don't think I can add much more to that. I mean, it just. It was really. So, it, you know, the 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 other kind of moment for me in realizing that there was something I could write about in the what became this book, Ways of Being, um, was to was really this moment of bringing together like two, um, particular ideas. Like I spoke more broadly about this idea of artificial intelligence than non human intelligence, but also like things that are actually being done with them in in the present moment. And that moment, you know, was um, was on the one hand research into a, a kind of um, more equitable forms of politics that are being practiced in various ways in the moment, in the present moment. Uh, things that have a long history, like sortition, which is um, election by lot rather than voting. I people are chosen essentially at random uh, to to take various kinds of office, uh, which is how we do jury service, right. uh, but nothing else anymore. But in various places at various points in history, that's actually been a huge part. It was a big part of Italian politics in the Renaissance. It was a big part of ancient Greek politics at the very beginning of what we call democracy. But it also has antecedents in um, uh, the Hordenossi Confederacy of, of native peoples in North America, uh, in, in southern Indian. Uh, it, it succeeds. It continues in various forms in southern India today. Uh, so it exists in all these different cultures. We've tried these different forms of uh, making democracy making something like democracy um, that is more equitable, that doesn't, um, that breaks, that tries to do some kind of end run around all the various kind of biases that are built into the system. Most of those biases within our present system are monetary, right? It's rich people get to run, rich people get the education to get into positions of power, they have the money to spend, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's that's the condition of most societies we live in these days. But there's there's also all, all other kinds of biases, race and and much much more that are built into those systems, um, to produce and and you can do an end run around those, uh, with something like sortition. Uh, it's just one of these weird technologies you can try. It produces these kind of very interesting results. But one of the most interesting things it seems to produce, is uh, a particular problem solving ability, right? Which is that um, uh, bodies, communities. 
assemblies they call them citizens assemblies sometimes um that are built from these random assemblages of people seem to be better at certain kinds of problem solving than traditional assemblies parliaments the things we have now these kind of narrow bodies of either domain experts or of the people who just were loud and rich enough to get into power um something is happening there that seems to be due to do with the diversity of intelligence that's what people who study this seem to think they, they, they seem to think that basically if you put a bunch of random people together you don't get group think um, you also don't get like radical division what well, you get a bunch of different life experiences encounters um, all these different ways of seeing and approaching the world maybe they they work they come together to create a totally different way of seeing problems and thinking through them and at a time of you know, when we seem to be really struggling to come up with novel answers to very difficult, thorny societal and environmental problems, that kind of something that can break the gridlock of our thinking is very powerful. Um, that's where I get interested in things like this. Uh, you know, and, and then and the other half to that was, well, if, you know, and here's a thousand examples I could give you about how intelligent non-humans are, right? And that if you're serious about saying that, the, the answer to, or one way to at least move us through our current kind of impasse of inability to think about new things about new ways of being in the world new ways of addressing some of the problems that we all face together as a planetary system um you know if that is best addressed by a radical diversity of intelligences then you have to include the intelligence that exists beyond the human because how much more radically diverse could you get and so one of the things we have to do is to think better about how we come into relationship with other species so that we are capable of asking them questions, learning from them in all kinds of various ways that we can only barely begin to imagine. And some of which will probably look like shamanism. Some of them will look like weird scientific experiments. But whatever we're doing, we need to we need to move in that direction as quickly as possible. And that is a politics. And that has real world consequences for our relationships with each other, with our governments, with corporations in the present moment. That is kind of one way of perhaps guiding our response. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to make sure that people, if they have questions, they can put them in the chat. Um, we have a few, you know, 10 minutes or so left to this conversation. So people, please do put that in there. But maybe while uh, we're seeing if people um, want to speak up on these things, um, maybe I can ask you a question just stepping back from the book um, that I first became aware of your work through your artistic production, you know, which is is still um, really vital, it seems. Um, but how how did you how do you think about I asked you about uh, sci fi work, but how do you think about your own work and your own kinds of art, artistic practice that you do in relationship to all these things? Because you're working on projects that relate to uh, the topics that come up in your books, too. I'm thinking about server farm and, and things like that. We do have a question that just came up, too. So I want to Get to right. that. Well, you have to briefly say, um, like I, uh, I've always wanted to be a writer. I like writing and 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 and, and writing and reading are probably my first loves. But yeah, I seem to have this kind of weird hybrid practice where things also come out as objects, um, as films, as talks, as whatever, like, is a useful vessel, um, uh, or whatever I happen to get some money paid to do because that's the reality of doing of doing this kind of work um but also critically i think it's just worth point they're all they're all actually just modes of inquiry for me like like i learn something i'm, I'm interested in, in learning things about the world and sometimes that process of learning takes the form of making a thing and sometimes it takes the form of writing about it um and it's very wonderful when those things are then interesting to other people who might want to come along a bit on that journey. Um, but they're largely processes of like self-education research and <laughs> trying to answer some weird questions I've got. Uh, and those just come out in different ways as they come along. And it seems like a kind of research that wouldn't necessarily always be welcome in um, a academic or corporate kind of structure of a research lab because it's, um, you know, orthogonal in some ways to the goals that you know organized currently not it turns <laughs> out yeah i could say after like yeah. some decades of, yeah. of not fitting into those kind of environments yeah yeah, it doesn't, yeah. You know, so let me let me get to this question that just got pushed way. to me in in the chat and um the the author writes i wonder what you think about the possibility of designing ai with robust autonomous ethical capacities in such a pro uh, is such a project misguided, according to your description, uh, current AIs are just really powerful and fast computers, which lack emotions, intuitions, etc. And these sorts of things uh, might 
be necessary for what we might call moral intelligence? Or is it possible that advanced AIs in the future might possess non-conscious features that could play the same functional roles at, that emotions and so forth play in human agents? Could robustly designed, at, could robustly ethical AI of this kind help alleviate the concerns about existential risk from AI? No, they make those concerns significantly worse. Um, but I'll explain that, and I don't, I don't want to be mean about the question or anything. But if I've understood it correctly, it's there's kind of two things going on. One of which is that, like, could AI have emotions and feelings, or the things that we call emotions and feelings, and whatever they are, because we don't understand what they are, and we have had a whole hour long conversation about this without even using the word consciousness, as far as I'm aware, which is which is such a huge complex thing is why you should just talk about intelligence. Because um, that's kind of you're having a conversation at a different level. But if you start talking about emotions and feelings and moral judgment, then you're kind of moving a little closer to what we call consciousness, I think, in various ways. Um, so I'll say, rephrase what I said earlier, which is that I have no problem with a theoretical idea that you could have well, I have no, I obviously have no problem that you can have no non-human consciousness, right? I obviously don't. And and whether that's animals, plants, microorganisms, fungi, or rocks, right? <laughs> like, those things have agency and act. Um, I, I already believe that. So I, I believe, like, I, you know, I, I, I can make the argument why AI might possess those things in the future, but my kind of but it's almost kind of moot to me uh, because like everything already has some form of agency and personhood. Um, uh, my problem with the question, if I've understood correctly, is that the idea that, that could be robustly designed. Um, like we can't, we can't do that for ourselves. Like we don't have robustly designed morals as systems, either as individuals, as communities, as nations, as, as a species. Um, if you ever tries to design anything on a computer uh it's miserable right like it's um uh like computers are really hard <laughs> to work with uh, um and the idea that you could you could set any kind of uh meaningful guardrails on like these kind of very large guardrails. this one of the terms i think the area kind of acceleration people use is, is guardrails mm -hmm. i mean the guardrail like it's an off switch, but also it's, uh, I think, some way of robustly designing some kind of particular framework for this. Like this has been tried in part in the history of AI, like multiple times over. Um, you know, there was an era in the kind of 70s and 80s when they stopped doing the kind of connectionism neural network model, which dominates now and started doing these things called expert systems, um, where they just tried to like describe the world functionally from the ground up. Um, it's what they started doing with, with self-driving cars as well. Um, is that they initially thought like they could just build self-driving cars by programming a whole map of the world and all of the rules of driving into the car, right? Um, that you could, that if it just had an accurate enough map and it knew the laws of the road and it had like the cameras and stuff, then it would work, right? And it's like, no, that, that survives five minutes out in the real world, which is not actually defined, let alone capturable by accurate maps, uh, by pre-described um uh behaviors by you know um by uh by anything rational in that way right it's just not the way we're... and the way they solved that was by by making them learn um so could ais learn ethical behavior right so there's just to be clear there's absolutely no way we can pre-design ethical moral good behavior whatever that means whatever we'd like it to mean we can't pre-describe it into machines in any way that's going to do any good what we could do and this is like to take the self-driving car example is we can put them in situations where they learn it um so they have some kind of baseline form of intelligence and then they learn it well that just sounds like what we do with children right or pets um or literally anything else that we share space with and have relationships with so what it means we have to have relationships and therefore it gets to the question of like well what sort of relationships do we want to have and once again, we come up against the political question. What sort of relationships do we want to have with this imaginary AI or with our kids or with the bears that live in the woods or the fish that live in the sea? Like what sort of relationship do we want to have that will produce right action, not only in them, but also in us as well? Like how do we come to some moral and ethical arrangement together? 
These are big philosophical questions that are about how we want to live. And I don't believe that anyone who works for a large social media company who, you know, is currently building these systems to take that one really boring, annoying example is going to program good moral ethics into a machine. Mm -hmm. And we know they're not because they already have those machines working for armies as autonomous weapons uh, of, 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 you know, working in oil platforms to optimize oil and gas extraction, which is going to kill us all. But they're, they're not doing that. They're not going to. It's not their interest. They're interested in profits. What we have the, the only way, yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll finish that oh. by saying the only way to produce ethical outcomes in machines is to build ethical worlds in which those machines exist. That's that's great. And I think we have a question that might, you know, pick up some of some of these ideas. And and then this will probably be our last one uh, for for this talk. But the the author writes, how do we develop these tools to see the world from different angles without seeing them lose their teeth and be co-opted by corporate systems? Is it unavoidable, like an evolutionary arms race between parasites and their hosts? Um, no, I mean, I don't think it's inevitable. Like, it's going to be home. Good old Ashley Le Guin, she's always there. Like, uh, capitalism feels inevitable. So did the divine right of kings. It ended. Um, like, there are other ways of thinking and being in the world, and we can construct those those other kinds of world. Um, there's always a huge amount of co-option that takes place. Um, there are always other ways of, of, of building stuff. Um, uh, the 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 analog to that, I think, which is you know the thing that I'm interested in is like how do we think our way into the experience and livelihoods of other beings, and the ways that I've sort of been touching upon throughout this talk a little bit, without without reducing them. Right? How do we maintain that kind of wonder and strangeness, and openness and possibility to chance encounters? to strangeness to new knowledge that is you know the kind of desired outcome of those encounters um and there's no there's no simple answer to that one either because it's just about what we want to do and how much we can hold on to that as a goal um we we are we are entirely capable of it um what's required is to kind of build um build into a practice build it into part of our agency where that is our that is our stated intent that you know, our intent in all of these kind of actions is to change ourselves and the world through our relationships to it. Um, that we are capable of, first of all, perceiving the world in a radically different way, uh, and then perceiving how that world could be different and being part of the the change that makes it possible. Thanks. I, I feel like that's a really great place to end, and again, a, a hopeful place um, for me on election day, which in Ohio cannot always feel super hopeful. Um, so uh, I want to thank uh, James for being here with us virtually, and to everyone at Urban Art Space for setting this up. To Taryn and Marine and Diane, and and for everyone who attended uh, online, thanks so much. Go out and vote if you are in Ohio or anywhere in the U.S. today. Like log off, go vote. Okay. So um, thank you again. Um, and thanks for being here. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks to everyone who made this possible. Cheers.